so this morning, let's jump right to Mark 7. I'll tell you what verse in a moment. This whole chapter deals with this topic, but I just want to focus in on some key phrases. I'll come back and preach this whole section again sometime soon. In fact, I've, that was on my heart coming into church this morning. Darn, I need to preach this right here, but I don't have time. But, but there, you'll see because the, the sections that I'm going to show you and the phrases that Jesus speaks preach themselves. Okay? But here's the deal. Jesus is continually harangued and harassed by the religious elite. The religious elite have found power and wealth in their positions, and they do not want to let it go. One of the ways they keep their power and their wealth is by continually, continually meeting in conclaves and developing all kinds of rules and regulations around a simple commandment of the word that's pretty clear. It's like honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. By the time Jesus gets there, there are 3,000 rules and regulations. This is without exaggeration. Rules and regulations that they invented to a lot of it to their benefit. I used to do that and people would faint. Now they go. <laughs> <laughs> they invented those rules and regulations primarily to their benefit. All in the name of, well, you want to honor the Lord, don't you? Then do what we say. How about doing what God's word says? How about that? No, 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 you can't make money off that. You can't get power off that. So do what we say. And so by the time Jesus comes, there's 3,000 rules. There's an example. They started as early as tradition. Before long, the tradition became equal to or more than what the word of God itself clearly said. Are you following me? Jesus is confronting them. Now, there's several issues he's confronting them on. I don't have time to preach those. They're deep and they're good and they're powerful. But let me just get to what he says. Mark chapter 7. Let's just pick up at verse 5. It starts with verse 1 in this whole thing, but just these few verses. Listen. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they asked Jesus. Those teachers of the law would be primarily rabbis. So the Pharisees and the rabbis asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders? That would be them saying, that's, that's us, <laughs> they're saying. Instead of eating their food with unclean hands. Kids, listen to me. This is not saying that you shouldn't wash your hands before you eat. This unclean is in parentheses here because the Greek word there that goes with the Hebrew word means a ritualistic way to clean your hands and what Jesus is saying the way you guys have put those rules around it you got about 40 of them and none of them come from the word of God oh maybe one or two but then they built from there and then they judge people but to get right you could bring your money and the rabbi would pray over you and then you were right with God again I'm so glad religions in the world don't do that now That's what that means. So much for me not preaching this. Anyway, why do you hold to your tradition? Or why don't you hold? They're asking Jesus of the elders. Instead, you and your disciples eat with unclean hands. Now, if Jesus was refusing to do those, that tells you something about it, doesn't it? This means yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, okay. This, Jesus replied, you know what, guys? Okay, that's not in the Bible, but Jesus replied, Isaiah, the prophet, was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. He wrote, these people honor me with their lips. Oh, we love God. We love God. But their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are only rules taught by men. Now watch. Therefore, you have let go 
of the commandments of God, the word of God, and you're holding on to the traditions of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of setting aside the commandments in order to observe your own traditions. Look at verse 13. He's going to say the same thing. And that, that tradition there that he talks about, Korban, that's another thing. I don't want to get into it. It'll take too long, but I will in the future. Verse 13. Thus, by so doing, you nullify the word of God by your own tradition and you have, that you have handed down. And you do many things like this. Let me give you a more common word for nullify. Thus you spit on the word of God by holding to your traditions and saying that they are as important or more important than what the clear water word of God says. Please hear me. If a tradition is wrapped in the word of God and if it honors the word of God and if it honors the name of Jesus and a church has a tradition of, <laughs> well, I, we've got a tradition of telling our guests we're not here to get your money. I think that's very biblical, and I think God has honored it. He has made this church debt-free in the last several decades. Everything, everything is paid for. Just people, people, you know, they give from all over the world. People give by live stream. We've asked them all during COVID, don't give your money to us. Give it to your own church. I think God honors that. That's a tradition we have here. So biblical traditions, traditions that are based on the clear word of God are fine. That's not what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about taking the clear word of, word of God and giving hundreds and sometimes thousands of different rules and regulations. And you know what? That's how they kept their relevance among the people. Does that sound something like Congress? We have more rules and regulations and laws on us now than ever. But you know, if we send somebody to Congress and they never write a law or a rule, they are judged as being useless. Do you see? You see how it happens? Sometimes there's no evil in people's hearts at all. They're just, they, they, they think they're doing their job. But then before long, it develops into this beast of its own. And that's what Jesus is talking about. You're spitting on the word of God. You literally spit on it because you say, well, it doesn't matter what the word says. We say, how come you don't have, you don't follow the 50 laws of the correct way to wash your hands ceremonially before you eat? Last Sunday, the world called it Easter Sunday. I stood right here and preached a little 30 minute message. And I was talking about Easter a term we, we don't use here all the time. We speak of Resurrection Sunday. But the problem is, is that the day the world celebrates as Easter is hardly, hardly ever, ever, ever connected to Passover and Feast of First Fruits. And you're going to see why right out of history. I'm going to read. Guys, y'all hang on. If you don't know this stuff, I'm not talking down to you because most Christians don't know. Most pastors don't know. I'm dealing with a few right now that I'm trying to minister to. They don't know. And so I'm giving them the same stuff and they're going, oh my gosh, I never knew this. So I'm not talking down to you. But if you've never heard what you're getting ready to hear, it'll peel your hair back. and It'll change your heart if you have eyes to see. Those of you that have heard it today you will have studied to show yourself approved and you will be able to accurately handle the word of God and you will always be ready to give the hope that is within you. And you can do it with gentleness and you can do it with patience and you can do it with clarity and you can do it with contextual truth. Now, what people do with it, probably some of them will spit at your face <laughs> in one way or another. Some of them will think you're crazy no matter what historical or biblical truth you present to them, because it is tradition. And it is a demonic tradition that has been swallowed up by almost every church and denomination on this planet. We have not and we will not swallow it here, and we're not going to stand in judgment and arrogance over those that don't know this, because let's be fair. 
We've gone through many generations in 1,700 years, and that tradition has now become truth. Our own denomination, they use that terminology in all of their literature. Have you ever heard of the Annie Armstrong Easter offering? Why can't it be an Annie Armstrong Resurrection Day offering? Well, when you hear it, you're going to say, oh, my gosh, we've got Easter Sunday school literature. We've got Easter songs that are written through the denomination to have people. We, in, in our cantatas and stuff, our Resurrection Sundays, said Jimmy and the guys, they have to go through and edit some stuff if they ever get any of it from them because it's got Easter, Easter, Easter. And on Easter morning, Easter, Easter, Easter. When you hear what you're getting ready to hear from the Scripture and from history, you're going to want to do that. So I talked about that, and I told you that this Sunday I was going to bring you evidence of things I was saying. I told you about it all starting with the Roman Emperor Constantine in a civil war that he was fighting. The Roman Empire was falling apart. The Council of Nicaea was held in 325 A.D., but by but at 300 A.D., just 25 years before, there was massive, and even almost up to the 325, there were massive, massive pockets of horrendous persecution against Christians. That's when they were being thrown to the lions, and their children were being pushed into the rings with lions while thousands of people gathered and laughed and mocked at their babies being torn to pieces because they wouldn't repent and denounce Jesus. That was happening. In the meantime, because of its decadence, its sexual decadence, its violence and filth and bloodlust, God had removed whatever hand he had over it, and it was falling apart, and it was now divided. And they were fighting a civil war and between two emperors, one that was ruling a big chunk of it and one that was ruling another chunk. And they fought a civil war. Constantine won that. One of the things that he did, he took the Christian church, which was now 300 years old and was quite an organization, in one part of the empire. And he took the Christian church in another part of the empire. And both of them, one of them had already succumbed and had begun to, res to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus on the Roman holiday, thoroughly pagan, the goddess of fertility that came, comes to our language, Easter. It goes through Ashira, Astarte, um, Ayana, um, all of those go all the way back to the Akkadian civilization, civilization in, the, in the cradle of civilization uh, in Mesopotamia, to the Sumerian uh, civilization, to eventually the Chaldean, you know, unmasking the Chaldean spirit, which became another word for Babylon or Babylonia to the Babylonian civilization where it finally winds up ubiquitously that goddess called Ishtar. I told you last week, so what happens is that the Canaanites along the Levant, that piece of land that encompasses Lebanon and Israel and Syria and parts of Egypt, the Levant, that curve in the continent there, the Canaanites, ancient people, they serve the god Baal. We call it Baal in English, but it's B-A-A-L in Hebrew, Baal. The word means Lord of all, and they weren't talking about Yahweh. And he had goddesses that surrounded him. Primarily, it was Ishtar. They built sailing ships and started conquering other lands, those Canaanites. Eventually, they were known to the world and are still known in history books and encyclopedias as the Phoenicians. They wound up in the British Isles, what we call the British Isles. There they found tin mines. That the people there had discovered tin. Very valuable in that day. And so the Phoenicians garnered those mines, conquered that territory. 
in the distant future, not too distant future, was an empire rising that was on its way up. But in the meantime, they had conquered the British Isles. There's a big remnants of a wall over there, Hadrian's Wall. It's one of the emperors that built a wall and, you know, to keep some of it, a border wall <laughs> to keep the people across the border out. Why? Because it destroys a country when you open your borders. It's just a truth. So all of that is historically accurate. I mean, I may have misspoken a little thing or two, but the, but the general of what I'm saying is historically accurate. So the Roman Empire, they took control and seized those ten mines. But they also found when they got there six altars around the British Isles to Ishtar, many more to Baal. Why? They were brought there by the Canaanites, the Phoenicians. Baal is one of the oldest demonic gods known in the Bible. Why do you think the first commandment at Sinai says, thou shalt have no other gods and goddesses, if you will, before me? The second commandment is, and don't build any landing pads for them either. Don't build any images. Don't be carving them out of trees or making them out of tin and silver and gold. Don't do that. Those demons don't inhabit those objects as much as they will just come to those objects because they know you've built them in their honor. They will show up. You build it, they will come. First two commandments. Those are not there to be silly children's bedtime stories, you know. Don't have any other gods. Well, I don't worship any other gods. And then we show up and say, it's Easter Sunday. It's Ishtar Sunday. Okay, I know some people say, no, you're just making that. Just hang on. Oh, no. So I told you some of that last week in so here's what happened. So the civil war was fought. Constantine won. Now one emperor over one nation again. He has dreams of making it this huge, powerful superpower of the world again. But he's got to keep the peace. He's got to bring together the pagans, the Jews, and the Christians. A lot of the Jews were in the Christian church, but a lot of them had already left because they were being ostracized by the Gentiles that didn't understand their Jewish connections to the Old Testament, the feast of the Lord, and how they're all fulfilled in Jesus. So it just became starting to become more and more secular, which Constantine found pretty easy to ply. See, if you keep letting the world come into the church, then it's a whole lot easier for the world to dominate the church. And so you want to bring your junk in here. <laughs> you want the Mason Lodge to run this church on Tuesday nights? Ain't going to happen in this church. For example, you can give the Lord a hand if you want. I know I've just made a bunch of people mad, but that's all right. We've fought that battle, and so we stand in the world. And I can go on and on with ideas and things that come from the world. The world says it's legal for anybody to just marry whoever you love. We don't perform marry whoever you love weddings in this place. We love people who are in that lifestyle, who are looking for some kind of answer, who are looking for some kind of truth, who are looking for a little healing, maybe from something else. And I'm not going to say no, because you're living in that. We're not going to minister to you. I, we do not say that here. But we will speak the truth about the lifestyle, because God's Word does, in context. So if you bring the world in, and let the world rule and reign in, then before long, we're not much different than the world. And that's basically how the church was getting around 300-ish A.D. Constantine comes, and at the Council of Nicaea in 325, he's bringing these churches, these big connections, these denominations of Christianity together, and he says, I am now the king of the church. He said, there will be no more persecution of Christians, and the Roman government will take care of you. Now, in deference to those early people, I'm not making fun of them and I'm not, not judging in this, but they, thank you, O oh emperor. We don't have to see our grandchildren and children slaughtered in the lion's dens anymore. 
government, please take care of us. Are you following me? So the church has acquiesced to what you're getting ready to read. And it's been that way for 1,700 years. Tradition that has now become truth. And if a pastor like me or a Christian like you dares to speak it to a leader of the denomination who's and <laughs> power and money comes from that, you are anathema. I've lived it. A lot of you have lived it. You know I'm telling you the truth. So from Zev Peratt's newest book, I'm not here to sell a book, and he's not either. He doesn't even know I'm going to do this. It's called Blood Alliance. I did write the foreword to it. I've read every page of it. There are a few chapters in here I actually wrote, and then the editor edited them, of course, because he asked me to. And he actually says that in the book. He said, I asked Pastor Carl Gobbs to write these couple of chapters here. So I do have a vested interest in the book in that it's so filled with so much researched, referenced by scholarly resources from ancient days right up into modern days, modern linguists, linguists of dead languages from the Levant, from the Middle East. They can speak and write and read, read languages that are dead. These people are referencing this book. This is not something Zev pulled out of his back pocket or the few little chapters I wrote that I pulled out of my back pocket. You can read it. You can get all the references if you want it. Again, I'm not here to sell a book, but I'm using this because I told you what Constantine said. I'm going to read two or three paragraphs of about a four-page edict that he launched. This is not out of context. It comes right from the beginning, and it gets worse and worse and worse. And I, those pages are not in here, but he references where you can go read it. Here it is. Constantine's own words. From, from Emperor Constantine to all churches concerning the date of Easter, dated A.D. 325. Now remember, when he says Easter, and I'm going to prove this to you in a moment, he's speaking of Ishtar, and he knows it. He's not ignorant. He's thoroughly pagan. The Roman Empire is, per, is, is thoroughly pagan. See, she's the goddess of fertility. So, and you're going to... Just wait. I'm going to get ahead of myself in my mind. When you hear the historical research that's been going on for a thousand years on this, and you hear these scholarly people with degrees as long as my arms and what they have to say, you're going to freak out because it comes right to our day this week. So just hang on. So when he speaks of concerning the date of Easter, just put the word in your mind. Concerning the date of Ishtar, the goddess of fertility of Baal, the celebration that we have every spring here in the Roman Empire, that's what he's saying. Concerning the date of Ishtar, I, Constantine. So he said, at that council of Nicaea, we considered the issue of our holiest day. Who's our? The Roman Empire. And they're trying to make it the holiest of the church. At the council, we consider the issue of our holiest day, Easter, Ishtar. And it was determined by common consent. <laughs> Everybody agreed with me. Well, yes, you're the emperor. You just saved our children and grandchildren from the lions, but if we speak against you, you will throw them back to the lions. So, yes, we agreed. Do you see? I'm glad the world doesn't play these games with us now, aren't y'all? <laughs> and it was determined by common consent that everyone, everywhere, that means pagans and Christians alike, Everyone, how many is everyone? Everywhere, how far is everyone? Should celebrate it, Ishtar, on the one and the same day. That means pagans and Christians, regardless of what day. For what can be more appropriate in our empire or what more solemn 
than that this from which we have received the hope of immortality. I know you're thinking, well, he's talking about Jesus. Well, kind of, sort of, but Ishtar offered immortality as well. That's why they worshiped her. She's the goddess of fertility. She can bring something dead out of the ground back to life. You, you got to know <laughs> what they're talking about. Put it in the context. If we read it through our eyes, where Easter has always been used by every church almost in every denomination, and we think, well, that's just a celebration of Jesus' resurrection. Uh, that's not the way it started, and Constantine is saying so. But now he's pulling the Roman Empire back together and he is putting his foot on the necks of pagans and Christians and saying, stop this fight. And you Christians quit fighting against each other and you Jews and, and Christians better start getting along because we're not going to have another civil war. I am the emperor now. Does that make sense? Amen. That's what this council was about. The, all, all of the reputable historians agree to that, what I've just said. So he says... Receive our hope of immortality. All of this should be kept by all the people in the empire without variation, using the same order and a clear arrangement. And he goes on to say, get ready. And in the first place, it seemed absolutely unworthy for us to keep this most sacred feast Ishtar, Easter, now that the church has said it's going to do it, following the customs of the Jews. He just trashed all seven feasts of the Lord. All seven that Jesus has fulfilled. All seven are mentioned through, from Matthew to Revelation. Revelation mentions three of those seven feasts. The other four are said over and over. Fulfilled in Jesus. Fulfilled in Jesus. Passover lamb. He was the lamb slain. He is the bread without leaven, without sin. He is the first fruits from the dead. He rose from the grave. He is the birth of the church through the giving of the Holy Spirit. He is the one for whom the trumpets blow. He is the high priest of the great day of atonement. If you're under the blood, you are freed from the wrath that's coming. If you're not, you will suffer the wrath of God. He is the, he is the head of the Feast of Tabernacles because Tabernacles, he represents God. He is God, but now he's in the flesh. He represents God who dwelt with his people in the wilderness until he brought them to the promised land. Those are the seven feasts Constantine has just spit on them, which is why today you hear megachurch pastors saying, we got to separate ourselves from that Old Testament junk. We're not Jews. We're, well, nobody said we were. Jews and Gentiles together, Ephesians 2, are the one new man in Jesus Christ. We are the new temple that is being built. That's the only place in the New Testament where a new temple in the last days is literally mentioned of in black and white. That's it. And I know not, now your minds are, well, well, what about, what about, what about? I've written to it. I've preached on it. I'm blue in the face. I've got books I've written. It, it's, it's the only place. And tons of of renowned scholars agree. So I'm not making this up. I'm not pulling it out of my back pocket. But Constantine goes on. Let me finish this and emphasize these words very quickly. Therefore, have nothing in common with the customs of the Jews, a people who have soiled their hands in a most terrible outrage. They have polluted their souls, and now they're blind, and they deserve to be. Therefore, have nothing in common with that most hostile people, those Jews. We have received another way from the Savior. In our holy religion, the Roman church now, we have set before us a course which is both valid and accurate. It's neither. Let us unanimously pursue this. Let us, most honored brothers, withdraw ourselves from that detestable association with the Jews. You hear any of that in the news today? Let's rather align ourselves with Hamas. Not those Jews. Keep reading. On what subject are those Jews even competent to form a correct judgment? After all, they murdered their Lord, lost their senses, and are led not by any rational motive, but by an uncontrollable impulsiveness to whatever their innate fury may drive them. Excuse me. They murdered the Lord? Uh, Pontius Pilate had nothing to do with it. The Roman government had nothing to do with it. The Roman soldiers who drove the nails had nothing to do with it. The people in the crowd, Jews and Gentiles, shouting, crucify him. It was just the Jews. 
Do you see how Satan is working? It's called the Chaldean spirit, the Babylonian spirit, the spirit of Ishtar and Baal that has now been transported to Europe, to the Roman Empire. And now Constantine steps in and says, I'm now your savior. Your children will no more die in the mouths of lions. But you will do what I say. And you will join with the pagans. I know your celebration comes at about the same time of year. You will join with them and they with you. They can celebrate Ishtar. You can celebrate Jesus. But it will be called the celebration of Ishtar. Now, by now, the Latin name is Oestre. That was adopted by the Germans. You will hear that in a few moments, right across their borders, whom they fought with an awful lot. And so you'll find writings in German about Oestre. You'll find writings in the Latin about o Oestre in encyclopedias and history books. A lot of people feel that's where the word estrogen comes from. Sounds almost like it, doesn't it? Female goddess of fertility, Oestre, Ishtar, Easter, the Old English to now our English. Do you hear it? Do you see it? All right. I'm going to prove all this to you in a moment, but first I want you to hear his edict. So let me just do one more thing. They've lost their minds. You hear his hatred for the Jews. He says, this is why in this manner they do not perceive the truth. They cannot. So they constantly err in the utmost degree about the most important things. Actually, these four paragraphs you wrote, Constantine, have erred all the way through. You are an ignorant biblical fool, Constantine. But the people were terrified of you, so they bowed at your knee. He says, so first, it was desirable to change the situation that we have nothing in common with that nation of father killers who slew their Lord. We must then unite in desiring whatever common sense seems to demand. How about what the Bible says? And what has no association with the lies of the Jews. Christian churches all over the world and all over America come to our Ishtar services. Out on the signs, we'll have Easter egg hunts. On the church grounds. Some even say, Easter Bunny, visiting Sunday school, come to our church. It's a marketing ploy. Sermons the preacher gives because they're sent out by the denominational headquarters talk about, well, there's an egg, see, and it's got yolk in it. But then sometimes you come across an empty egg, and that represents the empty tomb of Jesus. I've seen these sermons. I've heard people talk about their preacher preaching the most wonderful sermon on Easter morning, and I am just about to pass out as they're talking. I know you don't believe this, but I hold my tongue. I mean, unless they ask then shame on them. <laughs> but I'll be sweet, but I will tell them the same stuff I'm telling you. Most of the time they look at me like I'm from Mars. I just write out the word of God, which you will see in just a moment. All right, so I've done that. Now I need to back up some things that I'm saying. These mean nothing to you, but I want you to hear them anyway because you can look them up if you're taking notes or later you can you know, watch this sermon, take the time, pause it, write them down. These are the references. Everything I'm going to say from this point forward come from these references. Please, please bear with me. I've got to say this because this is going live and it's going to be archived and people will say, that's just your opinion, your opinion. No, no, no. All of these are reputable scholars known the world over in these areas. You'll see anthropologists, archaeologists, biblical experts, language experts. From Gwendolyn Leake, a renowned anthropologist, known for her writings and research on the Mesopotamia. In 1994, she wrote a book called Sex and Eroticism in Mesopotamian Literature. You're going to see why. New York City published in New York, New York, Rutledge Publishing. It's even got the page numbers, and I'm not going to bore you with all this. Then, then another reference is Stephen O'Murray, Will Roscoe, uh, 1997, Islamic Homosexualities, Culture, History, and Literature, New York, New York. It's got a lot about Ishtar. 
Ilan Peled because this, 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 this cult of Ishtar went all over the world. Ilan Peled from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, professor, Journal of Near Eastern Studies, volume 73, number two, October 2014, published by the University of Chicago Press. Edward Lipinski, Gods and Goddesses of the Phoenicians and the Pun Punic, Punic Universe, volume, 60, volume 64, Louvain, Belgium, Louvain University Press. Richard S. Hess, 1996, Ashira or Ashirata, from the Nova series, volume 65, number three, 1996, published by Peters Publishers, cataloged by JSTOR Academic Papers website. Those are the main ones. Everything I'm going to say about Ishtar, I'm taking quotes in context from them. There's another one, a Steph F. Scott. I've saved him for his quote. So I'm just going to say these without giving reference to which one, but it's in all of these. Here are the quotes. Inanna, I-N-A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, is the ancient Mesopotamian, Mesopotamian goddess of love, war, and fertility. She is also associated with beauty, sex, divine law, and seizing political power. Are you hearing me? Inanna. You say, well, that's who's Inanna. Inanna originally worshipped in Sumer, the Sumerians, one of the earliest civilizations of Babylon. She was known by the ancient Akkadian Empire, which was even before the Sumerians, from the area of the Euphrates, Babylon. The Sumerians, the Assyrians, and the Babylonians, Inanna was known through all of these empires as Ishtar. We see in the word, we see in Greek literature the word astarte. It's the Greek form of the Semitic goddess Ishtar. In Akkadian texts, Ashira appears as astarte. Astarte is linked to Mesopotamian goddess of Ishtar. So all of these names, Astarte, Ashira, that's all through the Bible. And you will see what God says about Easter in just a moment. Yeah, but our tradition is, I don't care about our tradition. As if Jesus can say that, I can say that. We're his ambassadors, right? Don't we want to speak what he would speak? But it's the tradition of my family. Not really. It's the tradition of Constantine and the early pagans and the Phoenicians. And, the, and they made it the tradition of your family. And now you don't even know why it's tradition. And you will spit in a preacher's face that shows you the word of God to hold to your traditions. Thus nullify the word of God. Y'all with me? All right, you're just getting the sermon I promised last Sunday, so if you're here, that's on you. Okay. <laughs> Let me keep reading. And Nana Ishtar Easter is alluded to in the Hebrew Bible. Her primary title is, and I'm, I've got it here, but I want you to see it with your own eyes, so I don't want to give it away right now. Ishtar's in the Bible. She's got a title. Inanna Ishtar Easter appears in more descriptions than any other Sumerian deity. Many of her characteristics involve taking over the domains of other deities. So what has happened in our own denomination? Oh, man, it's in all of this. Catholic, Assembly of God, Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, Lutheran. You can go through even a lot of the independent churches that think they're so holy because they say, we're independent from those denominations. Now, come to our Easter services. <laughs> I speak to these people all the time. And I get the same kind of hate and vitriol from them that I get from our own denominational people. It's tradition. You're an idiot. You don't know. Besides, we can't change all that. We'll lose people and we'll lose money and we'll lose power if we don't have people and money. We don't, they don't use those words, but that's what they're saying. It goes all the way back to Jesus' day when he was standing in front of the rabbis. Okay, now, I told you I saved this one. 
This is from Steph V. Scott. I'll give you his bio in just a moment. Here's how he starts his book. It's called From Ishtar to Orest, Oestre to Easter. It does, that's not in the title, but he says it in his book. From Ishtar to Oestre to Easter, reframing the Near Eastern origins of the Anglo-Saxon goddess. That means the Roman. On the 27th of March, 2013, his book says, the Richard Dawkins Foundation, he's one of the most famous atheists in the world, for reason and science, <laughs> what an oxymoron, posted a meme to their Facebook group stating that the Anglo-Saxon goddess Oestre and the Christian festival of Easter had their origins in the goddess Ishtar and Astarte. You know what they did when this famous pagan atheist said that? The churches basically all got together and resoundingly trashed him. What? They had to. They had to. They had to. They'd been preaching it and teaching it for all their lives and their daddy's lives and their granddaddy's lives. And now they can't stand in front of their people and say, we need to change. They can't do that. So they trashed. Now you can get on the, uh, the um, internet search engines and you can put in, is Ishtar related to Easter? The whole first page. No, no, no. That's stupid. No. And it's all by fairly conservative otherwise, Christian websites, modern day. Why are they doing that? It's heartbreaking. Zev lists some of them in his book and quotes them. I mean, he's not hiding anything. But then he says, now let me tell you the history. Listen to what Stephen or Steph F. Scott says. So Dawkins did that. He says, even though there are now many Christian organizations and institutions that now deny this connection, that's what I just said, a rigid academic investigation. See, there's the problem. Nobody wants to do a rigid study to show yourself approved. A workman able to accurately handle the word of God. What does that require? A rigid academic investigation. Well, I don't know how to do that. Then come to a place like this where people will do it with you and for you. And there are others. We're not the only ones. But get, we're getting far further and farther in between. But he says, a rigid academic investigation subject shows that Ishtar, Astarte worship, was prevalent not only in the Middle East, but down the Levantine Corridor into Egypt, across northern Africa, through ancient Greece and Rome, all across Europe, up to Iberia, that would be Spain and Portugal, and even into the British Isles, where she had at least seven altars dedicated to her. Ishtar, Easter. From there, her worship spread to the Germanic sources. We have at least three prominent academic Germanic texts which categorically state Oestre and Ostara was originally the goddess of Istar, Astarte, Easter. The fact that the endurance of Ishtar Astarte worship spans almost 6,000 years. That means almost back to the beginning of time. And we know that. The Bible tells us that. And half the world over. None of this should be taken lightly. This was a goddess elevated above all others during much of her history and who went on to influence a great many other deities. No other goddess in recorded history was venerated for so long and by so many. I'm going to tell you who he was and what that is, and then I've got to read a couple more quotes to you. Then we're going to Jeremiah. <coughs> Steph V. Scott. He is the pres Now, you heard all the truth he spoke. You heard all the references, and that's backed up from all these references. And Zev's book's got a dozen more other than these. I didn't just pull these out of Zev's book. I did my own research, and then I looked at Zev's book, and he's got a dozen more just like it. But listen who Steph V. Scott is. <laughs> this is why the world laughs at us. He's the presiding officer of the Scottish Pagan Foundation. He sits on the board of the Pagan Heathen Symposium, representing both Sumerian paganism and the Scottish Pagan Heathen Symposium, respectively. I went on to read. He's a very famous and degreed anthropologist, historian, 
thoroughly pagan. And he writes this to defend why they need to worship Ishtar. And he's saying, it's that same Easter that the Christians worship. Ha, 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 ha. He's laughing. I've been trying to tell people this for years, but I haven't been able to go. To, finally, I have a pulpit and a camera. So here we go. Coming from those other references I gave, listen to these two paragraphs. Then we're going to go to Jeremiah. Some Sumerian proverbs suggest that Gala, G-A-L-A, those are the priests of, of Ishtar, had a reputation for engaging in overt same-sex relations. The priests did. During the Akkadian period, one of the oldest on the planet, the male gods eventually became servants of Ishtar. And those male servant priests began to dress in female clothing and spoke with female voices. Another reference says, Ishtar became known as the goddess of transgenderism. In her own literature, she speaks, and of course it was written for her, I am female, I am male, I am all genders. The priest engaged in homosexuality, dressed in women's clothing, and spoke with a woman's voice. And churches say, come to our Ishtar services. Do you see why I have been so adamant about this for decades? I've tried to be sweet. Now I'm not sweet anymore. I've tried to be sweet, and I've tried to say, listen, just call it Resurrection Sunday. Just call it. And we do. And we're not going to judge somebody that slips up and says Easter because it is thick in tradition, 1,700 years. We need to differentiate when we speak of Easter. We're just speaking of the, the holiday that... The world celebrates as compared to four weeks from now is Passover and the Feast of First Fruit. We're going to celebrate again, but we celebrate every Sunday. What have we been doing this morning? Oh, my gosh. All about his resurrection, all about his power, all about his crucifixion. No other name. Every knee will bow. Thank you for the resurrection. Thank you for the cross. What is that? It's a resurrection service Sunday because every Sunday, the first day of the week, the Lord's Day, is a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Give the Lord a hand of praise. So it's okay. So on that Sunday, we're going to have another service. Now, you said, well, why did you have the Easter service? We didn't. We held a resurrection service on Easter Day. Why? Because we're accommodating the culture, but we will not compromise the gospel. Because that's the day that many people will come who wouldn't normally come to church. And we've told people, you treat them with kindness. You don't treat them as a second-class citizen. I used to get up. I used to be in churches with a preacher would get up and say, well, I see all the C&E Christians are here from the pulpit. C&E, that stands for Christmas and Easter. I've heard them say that. I wanted to crawl under a pew. See, you're my pastor and you're treating these people. This might be the only time they ever hear the gospel. Good gosh. Why? Because we, we know all about Easter. We got Easter services. By the way, we're having a big Easter egg hunt on the church grounds. Man, there'd be thousands of people here. But are you giving them Jesus? Probably not. Turn to Jeremiah 44. I'm going to give you the background. And we're going to read, oh, six or seven verses. But they're so important. Listen to me. Jeremiah lived and was writing during the days when the Babylonian Empire, you know, the Easter worshipers, they were on the rise. They had a new Chaldean king, Nebuchadnezzar. He looked down at what was left of Israel. The Assyrians had already conquered them before. One of their goddesses was Easter, Ishtar. Now the Babylonian king had entrenched that worship along with many other pagan gods. Babylon. I'm going to digress for a moment, but I'm coming back to this. It ties right into everything I said. So when I talk about 
Christians for 1,700 years. We've got this tradition woven through our churches that most pastors and Christians don't even know. And if we, I, you, others like me, you, dare to speak to it, we become the ignorant, ostracized ones. We're not the only people. That doesn't make it right. Do you know the Jews do this in a horrendous way before the world every single year? Of course, they have rejected Jesus. Have you ever heard of Rosh Hashanah? Doesn't that confuse you? They call it, this is our new year in September. First of all, the whole world celebrates it in January, but I, I know that that doesn't necessarily line up with God's calendar. Well, what's God's calendar? We don't know when the first thing. Yes, Exodus 12 says this. At Passover, Moses said, God said, this is to be the first day of your first month, Nisan. From this point forward, the first feast is the feast of Passover. Then unleavened bread, then the feast of first fruits, then the feast of Pentecost, then the feast of trumpets, then the feast of atonement, Yom Kippur, and then the feast of tabernacles. But it starts in Nisan. That's the first day of your new year. That's the Jewish new year supposed to be. Why do they celebrate it in September? Dr. Uri, I think it's Bayday, I've got his name up here, from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He did a scholarly background on it, and I was so proud of him. You can tell he dances around it at the last because he doesn't want to make his colleagues too mad, but he gets to the truth of it. Stuff I've preached right here, but I want you to know now it's coming from a Hebrew professor or scholar who knows the truth. He writes about it, and he dances a little bit, tries to stamp it down because he knows the rabbis are going to be mad with him. Why do they celebrate that September? They celebrate it in conjunction with, depending upon the calendar, Feast of Trumpets. This sounds like us. Sounds like America. We celebrate Ishtar in conjunction with the resurrection of Jesus. Well, when is that? I told you about me writing a denominational leader last week. He didn't know. I mean, according to the Word of God. He wrote back. And I had to correct him and say, no. He was crucified on Passover. He rose on the Feast of First Fruits all in that same week. Read the New Testament. He has a doctor's degree from a seminary. If all I could do is preach, I'd do it for free. But y'all going to pay me for this stuff right here. <laughs> <laughs> the junk I take, you take for just standing in the world. Look at the junk Jesus took. Look at the junk he took for us. Because he stood in front of the rabbi and said, you're spitting on God's word. Because you want people to hold to your tradition so you can make your money and keep your power over them. They crucified him. So I'm not saying, oh, poor me or oh, poor you. I'm just saying it's the way it is. Why is it this way? Say it with me. We're living in Satan's world. That's why it is this way. What does Ishtar do? She displaces other deities. She's done it in the Christian church in America, and nobody gives a rip. Just like June 26, 2015, Supreme Court said you can marry whoever you want to love. Most of the pastors didn't even speak to it, and to this day, almost none do. They don't give a rip. Why? It's law, which makes it tradition, which makes it right. Good is called evil, evil is called good, dark is called light, light is called dark because of tradition. I actually, I've preached and taught this before, but y'all are sweet. God bless you. But that explains why there's not 3,000 here. But that's okay. I know, I know. So Uri, here's what he said. The reason Rosh Hashanah is in September, it aligns with the Feast of Trumpets. But here's why. Nebuchadnezzar did come in. You know what day he came in? Ninth of Tammuz. That date aligns with June 26, 2015, the day the Supreme Court said gay marriage is legal. That was the ninth of Tammuz. Nebuchadnezzar breached the walls, tore down the temple, took them all into captivity. Took him some years to do it, but that's the day he breached the walls. The ninth of Tammuz. We spit in God's face on June 2015. 
under Barack Obama, his vice president, Joe Biden. Last week, Joe Biden gets up and he says, I proclaim today to be the day of national transgender visibility. People went crazy, but, and I said that, and I want to give you the backstory to that. And I want to get, just hang in here. I've got so much, but I'm, I'm all, I got to be done. But listen to me, listen to me. This is important. Here's the backstory to what he did. He did do that. I did not lie to you. The headline said it. All the major media said it. That he, on that day, proclaimed it to be. Here's the backstory truth. The first proclamation of trans, Transgender Visibility Day was done by Barack Obama, 2009. But it didn't fall on Easter Sunday. And I think, by the way, that's very appropriate. Easter Sunday, transgender visibility, Ishtar, the goddess of transgenderism. I am transgender, she said. The priests dressing in women's clothes and speaking in women's voices. Are you following me? Y'all, please, we got people watching. They think I'm hanging out here and y'all all, all, have all left. Okay. Okay, so I'm just saying, so I, I think that, but here's the backstory. 2009, Obama did this proclamation. Now, proclamation and law is two different things. George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, they issued Thanksgiving proclamations. Congress eventually in the 1940s made it law. Does that make sense? So it's not law, it's proclamation, which means every year the president has to reproclaim it for it to have any value at all. It's just, a, it's an acknowledgement to the world that this is where I stand, this is where your new government stands under my leadership. Okay, so he did that last Saturday. I got in the pulpit Sunday and told you that. But Obama instituted it. The next time Easter fell on March 31st, because that's the day he proclaimed, he said, I de declare March 31st, every March 31st is Transgender Visibility Day. So he did it in 2009. Easter didn't fall. Now, see, I'm using Easter correctly here, okay? I'm talking about the, the secular holiday. I'm talking about Ishtar. It didn't fall on March 31st. But in 2000, I think it was 13 or 14. No, it was 13. It did. He was still in office. Joe Biden was still his Vice President. 2016, of course, the election was won by Donald Trump. I don't know if there were any of those proclamations signed or spoken of by him at all. He may have. I don't remember them. It seems like there were a few that he proclaimed that I went berserk over and came to the pulpit and read them to you. I'm an equal opportunity basher, by the way. I mean, if it's against the Word of God, we're going to, talk, we're going to put it on whoever does it, right? Okay. I'm not a political sycophant. There are certain politicians I'd prefer be in office than others, the lesser of two evils. We live in Satan's world. That's almost always how it goes. But it was pretty quiet during those years. Then Biden comes in office. And he declares it March 31st. But to declare it, he has to sign a document again. So he signed a document. The copy of it's all over the Internet now. And it came right out of, out of the White House. It was on the White House website. I, Joe Biden, hereby declare this day to be, and it was all down there, and he did Transgender Visibility Day, March 31st, 2024. The next day, he caught so much flack from Donald Trump and preachers all over the nation who don't even know about Ishtar. He gets up in front of the news and says, I didn't say that. Y'all remember? And I'm thinking, first thing I'm thinking is, poor fella, he probably doesn't remember saying it. <laughs> but I mean, I'm really, I'm not being ugly. I'm just saying he probably doesn't. And shame on the people that are propping him up and using him for their power. It breaks my heart to watch that. So, so. But then the spokesperson for the White House, I can't even pronounce her name, but she gets up and she says, well, he didn't say that. That was done in last, last administrations. Well, yeah, his former boss. But he still had to sign it and proclaim it again, which he did. Is everybody with me? I just want you to know that. So back to Uri. He says, here's what happens in Israel every year. Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah in Hebrew means head of the new year. Head of the year. It, yeah. 
That's the best literal translation for our English. Head of the new year. Why is it? Listen to me. They went under captivity to Babylon. Jeremiah's going to talk about this. And the Babylonians, the ones they let live, they had to worship the Babylonian gods and goddesses. One of the chief ones was Ishtar, but there were others. And the Babylonians claimed this is the beginning of our new year because our gods, Marduk, Ishtar, Baal, they tell us that this is the day that they created the world. <laughs> See, the demons are taking credit for it. Well, that's what they do. Ishtar is trying to usurp the authority of God himself. And so the Jews saw that date and said, well, our Feast of Trumpets falls on it. Now, the Feast of Trumpets is fulfilled in Jesus Christ because he's the one that's going to give the shout and the trumpets will blow and we will be with him. And the trumpets are signs of warning to the last day's world of things that are happening so we will know that we are in the last days. But the, but the Orthodox Jews to this day don't get that. They don't understand it. Why? Because they've rejected Jesus Christ, who is the fulfillment of all of this. Does all that make sense? And so to this day, Rosh Hashanah, you know what the Jews say that it's all about? It's our new year because on this day, God created the world. They got that from Babylon. No, it was demons that said that. There's nowhere in the Bible that tells us which day of the month and year God created. But that's what the Jews say today. You know what they're doing? Unknowingly. They're nullifying the word of God. They, even people in Israel say, why do we celebrate this? This is not the new year. It's nobody's new year. It was the Babylonians. Well, why do the Christian churches celebrate Ishtar? It was the Babylonians. What does the book of Revelation say that God is bringing his wrath upon in the last days? Mystery Babylon. I want you to go to Jeremiah 44 with me. Here's what's happening. Babylon's breathing down their necks. Babylon's going to breach the walls. Babylon's going to take them all into captivity. Jeremiah's pleading with the people before it happens. Much the same as I'm pleading with the world now. Not comparing myself to Jeremiah. I'm just saying. I feel him. Because he's calling out the false prophets, the false preachers. And God is speaking to Jeremiah saying, you go and tell them they are false prophets. They did not hear it from me. I did not put those words in their mouths. They are liars. It's in the book of Jeremiah. Go read it. Oh, he went and preached it. They threw him in a pit. They ostracized him. They tried to kill him. They tried to run him out of town. You can read it. In Jeremiah 44, he's talking to the people from the Lord because they're doing something that God says, this is why you're going to go into captivity. I want to read something to you. As we get to, I told you I was going to save it to the last. See if I can find it. Well, I, okay, here it is. Here it is. I told you this came from these scholars. Inanna Ishtar Easter is alluded to in the Hebrew Bible. Her primary title was the queen of heaven. Look at Jeremiah 44. Chapter 44, verse 15. And the first words here, starting in verse 15, is that the men knew. They knew their wives were burning incense to other gods along with the women who were present. A large assembly and all the people living in lower and upper Egypt said to Jeremiah, we will not listen to the message you have spoken to us in the name of the Lord. Wow. I feel Jeremiah. Watch. We will not listen to your preaching, verse 17. We will certainly do everything we said we would do. We will burn incense to the queen of heaven. That's Ishtar. That's Easter. And we will pour out drink offerings to her just as we and our forefathers, our kings and our officials did in the towns of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. In other words, it's tradition. We've done it right in front of the temple and God has never struck us dead yet. You're going to hear what God's going to say about that in a moment. We're going to keep doing it, and it keeps our wives satisfied, and it makes things good for the whole nation. We're going to keep worshiping Easter. That's the English word. 
for Ishtar, who's known as, these historians say, the queen of heaven. We've just heard the queen of heaven. You're going to hear it several more times. Next verse. At that time, at that time, while we were worshiping her, we had plenty of food and were well off and suffered no harm. But ever since we stopped burning incense to the queen of heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, we've had nothing and we've been perishing by sword and famine. You know, yeah, see, the correlation is not that it's that you're under God's judgment. That's why. It has nothing to do with that demon presenting itself as a transgender woman man. The women added, when we burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings to her, did not our husbands know that we were making cakes like her image? You've heard of Easter cakes, Easter candy, Easter, uh, and pouring out drink offerings to her. Then Jeremiah said to all the people, both men and women who were answering him, did not Yahweh remember? And think about the incense burned in the towns of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem by you and your fathers, your kings and your officials and the people of the land. When the Lord could no longer endure your wicked actions, the Lord is slow to anger. He is long-suffering. He is patient. But he will reach a point where he opens the floodgates and brings the flood or the fire from heaven. Amen? Noah and Lot are your examples. When the Lord could no longer endure your wicked actions and detestable things you did, your land became an object of curses and a desolate waste, eventually without inhabitants, as it is today, because you have burned incense and have sinned against the Lord and have not obeyed him or followed his word or his decrees, his stipulations, this disaster has come upon you as you now see. Turn to Revelation 18 and we're going to close. Have you noticed the curses and disasters that are coming upon our nation? Everywhere. In the areas where God's word is preached and People seem to still take it a little more seriously than others. They seem to be a little bit more under the protection of God. Seems to. Chapter 18, John is being showing the last days. And he said, and after this vision, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority. And the earth was illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice, he shouted, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a home for demons and a haunt for every evil spirit, a haunt for every unclean and detestable bird, for all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adulteries with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. Then I heard another voice from heaven shout, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins. That's the wrath of God. So that you will not receive any of her plagues. Look at verse 7. Give her as much torture and grief, talking to the Lord and his wrath, as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit as queen. I am not a widow, and I will never mourn. And I'm going to add these words. I am Ishtar. I am the goddess of everything. I am Easter. I am queen of heaven. So she's going to boast in God's face. Verse 8, therefore, in one day, her plagues will overtake her. Death, mourning, famine. She will be consumed by fire. But mighty is Yahweh Elohim who judges her. Amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise. I told you, I'm the lawyer. I brought the case. You're the witnesses to what has happened. God himself is the judge. Astarte, Ashira, Anana, Inanna, 
you go right on through until Ishtar to Oestre, Oestra, Oestrata, to Easter, to Constantine. We're going to have peace. You churches, you can re- celebrate your Jesus if you want, but number one, disengage from that Old Testament junk. Number two, you're going to move the date of your services to the day of the goddess is Easter, Ishtar. The creator of the universe who's a transgender. Guys, can you see what is happening before our faces? Do you see what has happened through history? Do you see where we are? Do you see what's happening? I've spoken to you from history, historical sources, even pagan sources. To be fair, the pagans are laughing at us. They know. I've spoken to you from the word of God. I've shown you in context. Jesus looked at the Pharisees. He said, how dare you spit on God's word by holding to your traditions so you can make money and have power? How dare you? And God's wrath is coming on Babylon. What does that mean? Oh, he's just coming on the Middle East. No, that's the world system of the last days. The world is the Antichrist system. Mystery Babylon. He will control the whole world. The whole world will be forced to take a mark. Or you won't buy, sell, trade, or eat. All of that technology is now here. We're the first generation to have it. We're on the brinks of it. I don't know the date. I don't set dates. I say get on with life and enjoy it. But understand the days you're living in. Amen? Amen. Now, (sighs) the sermon I preached last Sunday, 30 minutes. I preached all that in 30 minutes. I just gave the synopsis. I know some of you smart alecks are saying, well, I wish you'd have done that again this morning. No, I I know, I know. But I'm just saying that that it was just, I I promise you last Sunday I was going to get into backing up everything I said last Sunday. So we put that video up. People from all over the world have written, have said very godly and nice things about it and about our church for daring to do that. People are getting freedom, but, but listen to me, only those with eyes to see. You say, well, what do we do? Well, you, you, we're, this is not a cult. I don't look in your windows. You might need to tweak some traditions in your home. That's up to you. Now that you know the history of it, I can't imagine that you would not want to try. There, be smarter than Satan. Be smarter than the world. You can play games with your kids that exalt Jesus, his resurrection, his crucifixion. Nothing has to be mentioned about all the other Easter trappings. You can do that. You can do all kinds of things that would be fun and family things and things that could really honor the word of God. We're going to keep our doors open every time the world says there's an Easter service. We just know it's a Lord's Day service where we're going to do what we always do. Now, we'll put on a better extravaganza maybe sometime with a choir singing 85 songs and drama and everything else. I mean, because it's all about Jesus. It always is. But this coming Passover, April 28th this year, four weeks away. See, Constantine made that. He said, yeah, we ain't celebrating that. Those father-killing, nasty, ignorant, idiot Jews. We're going to celebrate it on our most holy day. The day of Ishtar, Oestre, Easter. And everybody will celebrate whatever they want then. And you Christians, that's when you're going to celebrate whatever you want. I don't care. You keep the peace. And you do what I say. Or back to the lions. You go. And they took the mark. Are you listening? It's a little foreshadowing of the mark of the beast. If there was ever a time for you to surrender your life to Jesus Christ, if you have not done so, it is during these days, these most prophetic times since the first coming of Jesus. Romans 10, 9, I'll say it quickly. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, listen to me, not Ishtar. Don't get mad at the preacher because he has torn down the Ishtar pole today. You don't worship that anymore. Ishtar is not Lord. The government's not Lord. Political correctness is not Lord. June 26, 2015, Supreme Court ruling. That's not Lord. 
what's Lord is Jesus Christ and the Word of God. Confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe with your heart, that means with your life, that God raised him from the dead, no one else, him from the dead to prove that he is the Lord of life and then you shall be saved. Romans 10, 13. And whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I pray that this would be your day of salvation. Our battle's not against flesh and blood, but the powers of the unseen realm. Ephesians 6, the demonic powers of Ishtar, who's been here for 6,000 years, posing as a male, female god, goddess, when it is a demon, demonic spirit. And the churches all over the land for 1,700 years have invited that right in and put her name on the signs. And if you and I dare point to it, we're the evil ones. This is Satan's world. The evidence is before our eyes if we would just see it, if we have eyes to see. Let me pray.